EdTech Mondays Uganda is supported by the Mastercard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and the Innovation Village. Welcome. Sub-Saharan Africa, where Uganda is, ranks very low on the inclusive education meter. A study by the World Bank, for example, shows that one-fifth of primary age children and 60% of youth that age 15 to 17 are out of school. This affects the region's ability to tap into the advantages of inclusive education. On this episode of EdTech Monday, we probe the role that technology plays in increasing equity and inclusion in schools in Uganda. And thank you so much to my illustrious guests today for being able to discuss this with me. So I'll start with introductions. Maybe we'll start with you, Isaac. Uh, my name is Isaac Nwagaba, and I'm a social worker at Uganda Hands for Hope in Kampala, Namuongo. Thank you so much. Good. Uh, greetings everyone, my mm. name is Valentine Masicha. I am the founder of Mindset Coders, an edtech company that empowers young people and the youth with digital skills and 21st century skills. Yeah, thank you Raymond. Uh, my name is Edwin Tuinomjisha and I'm the director of Edmark Enterprises Limited mm -hmm. and Edmark Education Consult. Mm. I'm happy to be part of this show. Mm. Maybe we'll start with you, Edwin. Um, for many people, the definition of inclusive education can be uh, very. What would you say inclusive education is? Yeah, once again, thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, with uh, uh, inclusive education, very many people have not given it attention. But then, of course, it refers itself to you know, uh, the approach of educating these young ones, of course, at uh, their different levels, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of their background, uh, you know, gender, gender and uh, you know, religious mm -hmm. uh, affiliations. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we involve them the way they are, and we appreciate the nature of their you know, abilities and potential to you know, get involved in education uh, affairs. Mm -hmm. So basically, when you look at inclusive education, that is how it would be. But then mm. maybe the question for me and you, it should be, is it what we are doing in Uganda? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Valentine, in, in the definition of inclusive education, it, it would seem like Uganda achieves it all because we have, first of all, universal primary education, we have universal secondary education, and now we have some sort of sponsorship for, for university students to continue. And yet we see, for example, the gender gap in, in people who stay in school that makes it exclusive. We also see that a lot of young people from rural communities do not progress into the highest levels of education. Would you say that there's a failure of inclusive education here? Um, thank you, Raymond. I don't think we can call it a failure. I think we can say that we still need to put in more work. Mm. You know, we have to come together and see that we are not letting this child in the rural area of Uganda out of uh, the different opportunities for them to uh, get empowered or get the skills necessary to, you know, to be on the same level as the child in the urban area. And then we also need to um, see that what we are doing is actually affecting or, or, or impacting all the kids or all the learners in, the, in, in different schools at the same mm. level. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. Yes. Yeah, Isaac, the, the question would, would then be, you know, we've talked about rural learners, but yeah. even in, in urban constituencies, uh, and you work with slum communities, you understand this better. The income inequality gap means that the rich or children of the rich and, and middle class are more likely going to finish school Definitely. than those of, of the poor people. Why is that so? Thank you, Raymond. I Good question. I always also ask myself, why is that so? And uh, the answer is with viewers and everyone that is watching this show, because uh, why there is a very big gap between the rich and the poor, between the kids who are studying from international schools um, with the kids who are studying in, in, uh, in villages. Uh, I went to a, a primary school that is deep down in village, and uh, we always had a lot of challenges. You would come in P6 and uh, someone who is in P6 in the village uh, school is far different from someone who is in P6 in uh, maybe Kampara parents. There is, there is always a gap, a very big gap, and we are asking if we are saying that we are doing inclusive education, is it really touching base to uh, kids who are in villages uh, who 
is going to answer this question. But Should I say it's a government? No, I mean, government, government would say we've answered that question. We have a primary school in almost every constituency of this country. I know. But despite having that primary school, we still don't see completion rates. People who start out in P1 by P7 have dropped out. What explains that gap? Why do people get out of what essentially is free education? Because Ugandans want better services. That is one. Mm. Even when someone is real poor in the village, they know what is good and what is good for their kids. I mean, nobody wants their children to study in a very bad school. Mm. And so we're already thinking, how can I make it in life together with my kids? And so that brings in the complaint of, uh, is this inclusive education? Mm. What are we going to do to make sure that our kids have also got a better education from mm. villages to the cities? Mm. And for me, I usually think, like I said, I'm a social worker taking a hands off. Oh. And um, we have very many uh, you know, systems that have been put in place to make sure that at least we remember those kids in the villages. For example, organizations have come mm -hmm. and they've uh, tried their best to help I know children in the villages, you know, offer education. If you talk of technology, you know, computers in town, they've tried to push computers in the villages, but still there's no internet, mm -hmm. you know. There's still a lot of challenges, they don't have data. Mm -hmm. Even when you say that, you know, government, every primary school should have a computer. Mm -hmm. But the question is, uh, is electricity reaching? Uh, are these kids able to get data? You know, you remember the other scenario of a kid who went to the light and, and started revising the books on the road, uh, on the road. Someone is out on the street and are trying to revise their books. That means there is no electricity at home. Are they being included? Mm. That is a good question. Uh, Edwin, uh, the, Isaac makes it look like it's going to be very hard for us <laughs> to achieve inclusive <laughs> education because we can't put electricity in all the villages of Uganda and government and that kind of money. Mm. What can be done with the resources we have currently to make education look inclusive? or the outcomes of that education be reflected across? Oh, yeah, thank you, Raymond, once again. You see, uh, when you talk about inclusive education in Uganda, uh, we, we must debate and talk about this one as Ugandans. We know our Ugandan challenges, and we know, like he said it, you know, we, we know what Ugandans need, and uh, they also know that them, you know what they want themselves. Mm -hmm. But at the end of it all, you see, uh, to me, when we talk about, for example, UPE, talk about USE, uh, is it really very practical if we stepped into the communities? Are children going to school? Are they really attaining their you know, academic achievements the way they want them? And, and what could be the, the gap? Where is, you know, where, where is the whole system failing up? You know, so to me, I think there is something to do with policy and perhaps advocacy. We, we need to look into this. Uh, what is our current stand of you know policies if we say children must go to school you know we want them to attain some some academic achievements but then at the end of it all what is the income status of these people you see it, it has something to do with us ugandans and the entire system because many parents would wish to see their children go to school that's very true definitely uh-huh and then these children they would as well wish to you know attain a number of you know achievements which are academic and they, they would wish to become bigger they would wish to become uh, you raymond they would wish to become <laughs> me and some other person mm -hmm. you get but but where do we fail and uh, to me it will finally bounce back to the communities. We must cut out, you know, sensitization, community sensitization. We need to allow these people in our different communities understand that yes, you need uh, bread, but what is available is sweet potato. You now cut on, you know, your sweet potato for, for, for now, and then you push on as you wait for the better services that you really want. So mm -hmm. to me, I think if I was given an opportunity now, and of course, by the way, I didn't tell you, I'm a teacher by profession, so mm -hmm. I'm just sharing this one out of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I was given an opportunity today, I would start with community sensitization. Mm -hmm. Let people know that we have an opportunity for what is existing. Mm -hmm. Let's first grab that. Let mm -hmm. children go to school and attain, you know, what they must get. As we keep on pushing for government, put this right, put this right, mm -hmm. but we first use what is already available. Yes. Valentine, you have a point here. Yes, um, to, to supplement on what you have said, we've had different uh, sensitization and awareness programs going on forever. But now how about we change the way we tell the stories? For me, I believe that um, there's a way we can use technology to tell the story in the sense that uh, we give 
we build capacity in the teacher, we, uh, we help the parents understand that technology can actually uh, do something. It can be a skill that can change the, 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 you know, the whole uh, outlook on how your child sees their future, how they see themselves and everything around them. So we tell the story in a way that we've had a child go through PLE in the rural area, they go to a secondary, a government secondary school, and they still go ahead and maybe learn a skill in a vocational institute. And then they became someone in the society. How, mm -hmm. how about we tell that story and tell them that you really have to go to school, uh, you become someone important in the society, you become someone who adds value mm -hmm. in the society, and then have the parents also tell that story because we can always have uh, awareness programs in the village tell them tell the parents to take your child to school this is why you should take to school but why don't we change the way we tell the story mm. so it all comes down to using what we have mm. to mm -hmm. change the narrative yeah th the thing that i also wanted to ask you is one of the greatest equalizers in, in at least the last uh, four or five years has been the advance in technology uh, yeah. you can find at least a gsm phone in every corner of this country Mm -hmm. We'll struggle about the network, how to receive it and the like, but you can find it. Yeah. So what, what is it that that kind of technology can offer in terms of making education circumstances inclusive for, for as many people? Okay, uh, very good question. So uh, it comes down to the technology we have. We have the technology, we have the low-cost devices. So mm -hmm. who is the person to create this technology or the you know, interventions that we need? Who's going to innovate? So that's, that's where uh, someone like me come in. I be like, okay, I'm a, I empower young people in skills, uh, digital skills uh, development. I, he's in the space where he can come and tell us what are the people, the group of people he works with, what, what is it that they need, what is their each, you know? And then he can come in as someone who works with the society and we all come in a round table, bring the government in, bring different stakeholders, and we come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. So we have technology, we have low-cost devices, we have internet penetration that is not really very good, but how can we use what we have right now to improve our, the way, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the learners learn mm -hmm. and how we, we improvise the resources that we have at the moment. Yeah, uh, Isaac, you had a point to make, uh, then we yeah. can go uh, through I, a I, I just wanted to supplement and add something yeah. that, you know, you said that at least every village or every sub-county people have smartphones and everything. But I don't think every family has a smartphone. You know, in Uganda, Raymond, we still have families that can't even afford the small phone for the buttons. Mm. You remember that? Mm. Uh, we, have, we still have primary schools in the villages where kids, pupils, cannot afford to put on shoes. They're walking long distances to school. We still have uh, schools deep in the villages where you find teachers' welfare is at, at stake, you know? And this all affects uh, the learning environment and education in Uganda. Teachers, in, in, uh, I'm glad he teaches in Kampala, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think you would feel comfortable if they posted you deep down in where? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in Karamoja. <laughs> I, I visited a few schools where you find like teachers, you know, uh, staff quarters are so wanting, like what is happening here. So that means they are going to have, you know, uh, standards. The standard is going to be affected because they are not going to have good teachers. To afford a good teacher, mm. you must put in money. Mm. Mm. You must, you know, hire a person who is really, really well conversant with what you're doing. And laboratories, we are talking about uh, science. The government made it clear that science subjects are compulsory. Mm. But do we have all the equipments for the sciences in every school mm -hmm. in Uganda? Mm -hmm. That is a very good question. Mm. So. Mm -hmm very many things to think about. Mm. All right, Isaac, you're going to hold to that point. Let's take a very short break. When we get back, we continue the conversation on inclusive education. EdTech Mondays Uganda is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and the Innovation Village. Thank you so much for staying with us on it. Just before we took the break, we were discussing the role that inclusive education play, plays okay. in making sure that children all over the world get access to education, but also complete the education. And we're discussing that very specifically for the Ugandan context. And, and we'd stopped with Isaac, so I'll, I'll move to Edwin now. Um, Edwin, I, I know that you're a teacher. And in this, part, in this second segment, I really want us to talk about what technology can do. Mm. Um, 
using your experiences that you've seen, what is it that you would advise for policymakers around the technology space to make it more inclusive and also to send that to the same to schools all across the country? Yeah, thank you. And uh, in, in, in fact, uh, uh, Raymond, I would wish to join you gardens and we appreciate you know, mm -hmm. that technology is finally here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm one of the other few, uh, perhaps, you know, teachers in this country who, who move and I have reached almost in all these districts in the country, you know, trying to do the capacity building here and there. And at the end of it all, you know, you keep in touch with most of these teachers and uh, you see how you interact and the way they, you know, they expand on, on, on technology. So to me, I think finally Ugandans should just simply appreciate that we have it right here. And then the other thing, we should go in for it. In fact, if I had an opportunity, I would discuss with African developers. We just go on the table and look at how best we can, you know, roll down uh, the use of technology almost to every school, you know, every area in this country, so that at least, you know, learning is made a bit easier. Uh, I want to use uh, the experience that uh, really falls within my line. Mm. Uh, during COVID uh, period, uh, I, I conducted lessons on TV, you know, I conducted lessons, some of them were live, uh, I may not mention the TVs, mm -hmm. but I, I conducted live lessons, others were pre-recorded and of course aired, uh, you know, I had some lessons which were, you know, put on radio and I could just give my explanation in line with science, because I'm the science doctor in that area. So I eventually, I realized that we have just taken long pick on to this because it has already come and it's here. So to me, I think we should now start expanding around it. For example, you know, like if we could have the African developers and we, we get the cost friendly, you know, gadgets, we get cost friendly gadgets whereby, you know, almost all these schools, we can have teachers access you know, uh, internet, the content, because this content is there. Myself, I have made my content, it is on prime land. Prime Land, it is, it's an online school, and, and we are doing well. You know, we, we make this content and put it there, but we put it there for all Ugandans, regardless of your stand, regardless of your ability, regardless of your, 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 your location. My people in Oshin should be able to, you know, to, to, to get this very content, of course, you know, made by their own. So at the end of it mm. all, you see that there is still a need to push for some gadget cost-friendly. So that these people can can have the the gadgets and they the, the, you know they they access this kind of content. But mm. otherwise, technology to me it is the way to go, and mm. it is here. It's going nowhere. We just need to uh, you know embrace it and you know stand in for it, and we start using it. And of course, you know on the other hand, it goes hand in hand with the you know um, uh, this kind of training, uh, capacity developing. Uh, I mean capacity building then we shall look at professional development, you know, because at the end of it all, we are not going to chase away the old teachers who taught you during your generation, during, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not the generation, but during your time. Mm -hmm. uh, th this could be the teachers who were trained in a different mode, you see? But then we are opting now for modern pedagogy, where they must come in to fit into the current, you know, the prevailing situation. Mm -hmm. So there must be that kind of training so that they are equipped with the skills, the skills which can easily you know, manipulate and use these gadgets. And at the end of it all, they make learning interesting. And at the end of it all, you know, they make these learners feel like you mm -hmm. know, they're at home. And beyond that, you see, learners themselves, they have different ability, you know, abilities in, in, in line with learning. There's the one who will learn better when you, you, you put them before the TV. You have seen this one, we are family, mm -hmm. uh, you know, heads and maybe the fathers, we, we have seen this one happen. You know, they will tell you the story they have seen in, in, in cartoons on TV. Mm. But then if you told them to keep for you something today, after a week, they can't easily tell you where it mm. is. So it, which means they now learn and master the content much better and faster if you expose them such kind of, you know, audiovisual, you know, kind of, uh, of learning. Mm. So to me, uh, I just wish to, you know, encourage all Ugandans to embrace what is here mm. and it's all for our own. Valentine, people. if you could come in here, it, there's been a fundamental shift in the Ugandan curriculum mm. um, and it's now a more modern curriculum. Um, even the learning outcomes are now being measured differently. Um, what are the chances also in there for government to change the way they approach funding to the education sector so that they meet those learning outcomes? Uh, that's, that's very good. Thank you for mm. pointing that out. Um, mm. 
now that you have the CBC, uh, competency-based uh, curriculum, mm -hmm. we see that uh, learning is now more practical, and I think you can mm -hmm. attest to that. Learning is more practical, and learners now can can see and understand what they are learning instead of cram work and you know. So when you look at the practicability of all this learning, how c the government can come in and see that uh, there, there are different ways to introduce certain concepts, there are different ways to, to uh, engage learners that will allow them to internalize what they are learning and really see it, like you said, visually. And um, for me, in the, in, the, in the field that I'm in, I know that STEM can be learned in a way that is, you know, use the different materials you have at home to create something and understand the concept. You can um, get a, a, probably a game and make it into a, into a computer game or a mobile game and learn a concept in there. So all these things come together. We can put it in the curriculum and help the learner to understand mathematics in a fun way. They can understand science concepts in a fun way. They can understand maths in a fun way. So we look at all these resources we have around us. How can I get cassava sticks and understand math with it? So we mm. have all this and then look at the government and tell them, so this is the curriculum. We have these resources for the learner in the rural areas. We have these resources for the learner in the urban areas. So how do we ma merge the two? the two mm. resources and allow that all learners have a playing field that is balanced mm. and equitable for both of them and they get and we we shall definitely get a, a, a balance mm. and the impact will be felt in a way that we'll see that okay now we are including all learners and then we're also including the disabled children because now it's you know we don't have to have them in a classroom, understand the teacher, listen to them, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. But now we have them see what they are doing. We mm -hmm. have these materials that they're familiar with, they can touch, they can feel. So mm -hmm. I feel like when we look at that in that angle, understand that Uganda, we don't have the technology that developed countries have, then we can create something that is more impactful. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, yes. so, so now I, I want us to get to our concluding remarks because we've spent a lot of time discussing <laughs> this. So maybe we'll start with you, Edwin. Mm -hmm. um, what are your final thoughts on, on this inclusive education matter? Uh, thank you, Raymond. Uh, you see, uh, with the inclusive education, trust me, uh, we want to see a better Uganda. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, but it could be even the other day. But at the end of it all, we are not going, we are actually going nowhere if the system, our education system, is not focusing, is actually not running at the speed under which Uganda is running. So conclusively, to me I would look at, you know, some of the tested experiences. In Kampara, like he has said it, you know, we have tested technology. We have seen it work out. We have seen children do better even when they remain in their homes. You know, this is tested under period, you know, uh, COVID period. We have seen children do their homeworks. We have seen, you know, children engaged, you know, they can make some research online when they are at home and even when they are at school. So why can't we have such kind of a program rolled down into all parts of the country? And where is the challenge? Maybe if you pose the questions, many people would tell you about electricity, many people would tell you about, you know, internet connectivity, many people would tell you about maybe the gadget accessibility, many people, but then we have children in, in, in Ixoro who cross the lake to go and attend, uh, attend, you know, this traditional education. So why don't we, you know, borrow it from the already existing experience? So that at least, you know, the government, in case of, uh, instead of, of channeling, you know, uh, resources into A, B, C, D, we also give education priority. You know, uh, we, we look at what is the percentage of, uh, you know, of, of, of the national budget to, ed to the education sector. Can't we have uh, electricity extended to different parts of the country, if that is the challenge? Can't we have a fair, you know, internet connectivity extended to different parts of the country? Can't we have, you know, the, the, the system and the performance of these different schools improved on through, you know, conducting pre-recorded videos? We use these experts in Kampara 
they uh, shoot and record these good lessons, and then we roll them down. They just go to, 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 to different parts, Hoima, Masind, you can mention all these districts. So mm. the, the children who are in different areas in this country are benefiting from the same services you know, that are, are provided by the same experts mm. in other better places. So that at least we, we don't talk about inclusive education and we, we just end it here. But there is some practicability of you know, what these other different uh, citizens must really also benefit. So to me, I would, I would speak to the government directly that let this be rolled down. Let, uh, let us have you know, uh, some internet connectivity into different parts of the country. Let us have our own developers. Raymond, we can, we can do this. We have very many good, good you know, scientists in this country. Let them be given an opportunity to, to, to come up with uh, you know, these gadgets which are cost friendly. Let us have these gadgets extend to these different. You know, uh, we talked about the radio and, and, and TVs. Why would, for example, any family in this country fail to have a television? But of course, it is very possible and it is very true, simply because some areas are still lacking electricity and to mention. Mm -hmm. So in my own view, I think we can borrow this right from the experience which is existing and we let technology you know, be extended to different parts of the country so that we can help these children. You know, uh, we shouldn't keep on talking about the airport. Children in Ubshani, they hear about the airport, they can't tell what you are talking about. You know, they talk about copper mining, but you don't know what you are talking about. You know, they, you, they only end up, you know, viewing this stuff in the yeah. textbooks. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have another mechanism so that we can all fit into the modern pedagogy? Mm -hmm. pedagogy? All right, th th thank you so much, Edwin. Your final remarks, Valentine. Um, I'll add on what he said. All, this, all the points that he brought out, mm -hmm. it all comes down to partnerships and collaboration. So the government need co needs to collaborate with the private sector, they need to co collaborate with NGOs. NGOs bring different uh, mm -hmm. skills, they bring different uh, resources, materials, devices for some of them. Um, we have private sectors that do skilling, they mm -hmm. do uh, different assistive technology uh, innovations. So we bring innovators on board. We bring the government, we bring the teacher in the rural areas and then sit down and come up with solutions that will affect each and every segment of the learners that we want to reach out to. So for me, out of me, it's just partnerships and collaboration. Well, thank you so much. It's a good point. Isaac? Very important. You know, it's really hard mm. to talk about this and we don't actually address to the government because, I mean, it's the government that does everything, you know, and uh, we just come along to just, you know, help in pointing out some of the issues. So the government, uh, I usually ask this question, you know, because if we're talking about inclusive, we also remember the marginalized, you know, community. We still have girls who cannot afford a part in, in, in rural, you know, areas. And I've always asked myself, why is it really important for the government to supply free condoms in, in hospitals, toilets, and everywhere? But we cannot have free parts in all these community schools and everywhere. So, you know, if we are talking about um, subsidizing, then the government should really come out and uh, provide some of these things for free. Just like, you know, these guys who promote condoms, who promote very many, you know, things. This can also be promoted, you know. Let's try to provide funds for the government teachers for free. Let's provide computers in every school in the village for free. Let's provide, you know, everything that really helps education. I think the government has potential to provide them for free. Mm. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so <laughs> much, my panelists. Thank you so much to our viewers who've been yeah. watching us. This has been a conversation that's really interesting around mm. inclusive education and the role that EdTech can play in that inclusive education. We shall see you again at the next edition of EdTech Mondays. Have yourselves a good time. EdTech Mondays Uganda is supported by the Mastercard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning and the Innovation Village.